as we continue to worship our God through the opening of his word. I just want to say a special thanks to our worship team and the hard work that they put into uh, all the planning that goes in. Let's just open up in a time of prayer. Father God, I just thank you for today and the chance that we have to just come and to worship you even more through the opening of your word. God, I just pray that you would be glorified, that your name would be made much of as we continue to worship you today. May you use this sermon for your glory, Lord, and by your spirit, may this sermon be preached with the necessary power and the appropriate affection. Use this sermon to bring glory to your name, joy to your people, and salvation to the lost. Amen. The other day, one of my children asked me, so dad, well, how many countries have you been to? And uh, I think I started counting. I think I counted about 10. That's not like a crazy amount, but I'm blessed to be able to have gone to uh, some other countries in this world and to experience a lot of what God has created. This, this world is just magnificent. Like God, it just displays his glory. It's just an amazing thing. And it's been a blessing to be able to be part of that and to see how God uh, has created different regions and different weird looking animals and, and stuff like the platypus. Like, come on. It's a beaver with a beak or a, whatever. Um, so it's been really neat to see that. But one of the most refreshing things I've ever been able to be a part of is that a couple of times or a few times I've been able to go to a country and be part of the local body there, the local church. And just to sit there and, and have no idea what's going on outside of a translator helping me understand that. If it be an Arabic church or a South American church, just sitting there. And you know what's really neat about it as you're sitting there and, and you're in this different culture and the church is doing things in a different way? There's still a sense of family as you're sitting there. There's, there's something different as I'm sitting there feeling this, as I'm listening to the preacher preach, as we're singing these songs, some of them familiar, some of them really not. There's a sense of unity that is coming out as I'm listening to this. And it's really neat because as you're sitting there, there's no possible way that this strong feeling of unity can happen outside of the truth of the gospel. And as we look into John 17, starting at verse 20, going to verse 26, we'll be looking at Jesus' final prayer, not just to his specific disciples that are standing there around him, but to all who will believe in the word that the disciples will go out to proclaim. He'll be praying for unity. As Jesus continues on, as one of our elders read, our elder Dave read for us in chapter 17. If you have your Bibles with you, we'll be in, chapter, in verse 20. Jesus opens up this section. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I do not ask for these only. I do not ask for just those people that are standing right here in front of me. I'm asking for more, for all who are going to believe in the truth of the gospel, that they will go out and proclaim, this is the, my prayer for them. This is his petition to his father. That all who believe would be this. Through their words. We go back and go, well, what are these words? Go back to verse 3 and it says this. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ. Whom you have sent. Disciples are charged to go back out and to proclaim this gospel, to, to do what even Paul reminds us of in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. There's an assumption as we look at these verses, too that their mission will be successful. Because Jesus is already praying for those whom will believe in this truth. There is success 
His kingdom will grow. God will call people to himself through the words that the disciples will go and proclaim. And what is the outcome of this belief? As he continues on, as Jesus continues on, that they may all be one. Jesus prays for all believers who will believe that the words the, the, that who will believe in the words that will be proclaimed to them. And the outcome of this belief is that they may all be one. This is rooted in the being of God revealed in Christ and in the redemption action of God in Christ. The prayer that they may be one can also be looked at that they may be in us. That they may be united in purpose and mission. Just as the Father and the Son are one in purpose and mission. This is This is unity that adheres to the revelation of the Father, mediated to the first disciples through his Son, Jesus Christ. The revelation they accepted and passed on. There is a foundation that is being created in this unity. This unity isn't based upon uh, getting rid of common denominators, going to the lowest common, common denominator. This unity is based upon the truth of the gospel. Well, elevating it high. So Jesus continues on, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. We can go back to John 10, verse 30. The same word for one is being used here. In the Greek, the word is neuter. It means one thing, not one person. But the entire book of John actually distinguishes between the Father and the Son as distinct persons, but also one. They are completely unified in essence, in will, in action, so that what Jesus does, the Father does, and vice versa. And Jesus prays that we would be united in purpose and mission as he and the Father are. It is for Jesus' disciples too. We are still distinct, are we not? Thank God that we're not all Nathan Clausens. Nothing would get done. We'd just spend our whole time arguing. Telling each other that we're wrong. We are to be one in purpose as the Father and the Son are. In love. In action. Undertaken with and for one another. And we submit to the revelation that God has revealed that we have received. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, may they be the same. What is the purpose, the point of this unity? What is the outcome? As Jesus continues on, he says this, So that the world may believe that you have sent me. May they be united just as we are united, Father, so that the world may believe that you indeed have sent me into this world, that this truth is true. As Christians show genuine love for their brothers and sisters in Christ, it proves that we are Jesus' disciples. So the opposite is true as well. In a church where disunity is rampant, It proves that we're not part of the body. This display of unity is so compelling. It's so unworldly that the witness of, of, of a Christian to who Jesus is becomes explainable only if Jesus truly is the revealer of the Father whom he has sent. It is supernatural. This unity is supernatural and can only happen through supernatural means. This unity that Christians are called to has to be observable. So how often as Christians do we waste our strength in fighting against our brothers and our sisters in Christ instead of fighting against sin and the devil? 
how much energy has been wasted on preferences rather than fighting what we've been actually called to fight. John MacArthur put it this way, the effectiveness of the church's evangelism is devastated by dissension and disputes among its members. Our unity is actually directly connected to our evangelism. What we are called to do, to go and make disciples. There is a conduct that comes when we become a child of God. There's a change that happens. How many times have you heard from family and friends that you are sharing the gospel with and they respond with, how about you get your own house in order before you come and tell me to get my house in order? How quickly have we forgotten what Paul says in Romans 12, 18? If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The outcome of the gospel, the outcome of this truth, the words that, the, that everyone will believe in, is unity. Because it takes our eyes off of ourselves and places them upon someone who is greater. Unity isn't achieved by hunting enthusiastically for the lowest common theological denominator. But by holding to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God is true. Jesus is not praying for unity based upon our own personal opinions of who God is. He's praying for unity based upon how God has revealed himself already to his word. We are the people who believe on Jesus through the word of his disciples. We believe what God has revealed about Jesus in the Bible. Our unity began when we heard the truth about God conveyed through the word of the disciples. And our unity continues based upon this truth. In churches where the Bible becomes just a bunch of stories and not truth, you can see the unity eroding. But in churches that hold to the word of God is true, that hold to the gospel is true, their unity is a sign of that belief. In verse 22, Jesus continues to pray that the, the, the glory that you have given me. See, glory refers to the manifestation of God's character and his person or his person. Our unity displays God's character. Jesus has mediated the glory of God personally to first his disciples and through them to those who believe because of the message they were given. And he has done all of this that they may be one as we are one. If our unity reflects the, and glorifies God, our disunity does the opposite. It takes glory away from God. Which means by definition, it's sinful. That's why Paul hammers those very hard who cause disunity within the church. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not saying that if a church begins to deviate, if the leadership begins to deviate from the truth of the word of God, that you shouldn't put up a fight. I'm saying it means we put our preferences aside for the sake of the glory of God. And it's why it's so important that not only should the leadership be immersed in the word of God, but that us as a church individually and corporately should be rooted in the word of God. Our unity displays God's glory. And what is this glory of God? The glory of God is the weight of the majestic goodness of who God is and his resulting name. Or reputation that he gains from revealing himself as creator, sustainer, judge, and redeemer, perfect in justice and mercy, loving kindness and truth. God's glory elicits praise. It causes us to praise him when we reflect upon who he is. Jesus has mediated the glory of God personally to his followers and through them to those who believe because of the word. 
And he's done all of this so that they may be one as we are one. It's when we lose sight of who God has revealed himself as that disunity begins to happen. And he says this, and Jesus continues on. Love them even as you loved me. (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? How much do you think the Father loves his Son? How much love do you think is experienced within the Holy Trinity? How much? A lot. Perfect love. And Jesus prays. May you love them the same way that you love me. Think about that. The Father's love for the believers is comparable to the love for his own son. What an amazing thing to reflect upon. And our unity displays God's glory. The church is to be the embodiment of the revelation and the redemption of Christ before the world. So that the world may not only hear that Jesus is indeed Christ. One of the greatest mistakes, at least for for my generation, I think, is taking St. Francis of Assisi's quote, which apparently he didn't even say. You know, always preach the gospel, only use words when necessary. And no, you should start with the words and let your life back them up. We, we, we need to, our unity displays God's glory. The church is to be the embodiment of the revelation and the redemption of Christ before the world. So that the world may not only hear that Jesus is Christ, who, was, who, who, who has achieved redemption for all, as the Bible clearly states, but they may see that the redemptive revelation of Christ has power to transform fallen men and fallen women. Because without Christ, we couldn't even be here today as a family. The power to transform fallen women and fallen men into the likeness of God and to bring about the kind of community that the world so desperately needs. This world isn't even close to unified. Our own country isn't unified. Our province, political party divides begin. But in the church, we are to be united. Every Sunday morning, we meet at church. And as Barb was saying, I love to come today, come to church because it's family. And I get to see how people I haven't seen all week. I get to be reminded of who God is. So I can go out and proclaim the goodness of who God is to my friends and my neighbors who do not know Christ. But every week we come together. And have you looked around today? Truly looked around. Think about all the different jobs that are represented. Generations, retired people, moms, dads, singles, married, husbands and wives. There is no reason at all to sit and listen to me speak today outside of the truth of the gospel. There's none. There are many other cooler things to be doing on a Sunday morning. If you don't believe in the truth of the gospel. There's different schools, different sports teams. Some of them are worse than others. Different hobbies. Our bond is stronger than the bond that is shared by those at the same country club or stadium. All of us know and understand that we are sinners deserving of God's punishment. And having received God's grace because we believe on Jesus through the words of his disciples and his apostles, we share something more powerful than a common experience or a shared interest. We share Christ. And we don't need to compromise the truth to be unified. We need to hold the truth even higher. 
Our unity does not come from de-emphasizing the truth of God's revelation. Our unity displays God's glory. It proclaims his goodness to a broken world. So what does that unity look like in the church? What are the signs of a church that is unified? I think there's three. A shared commitment to biblical instruction. Unity flows from the commitment to the word of God. A center. A shared understanding of our new identity. That we are indeed in Christ. And he is the true vine. And at the moment of salvation we are placed in him. Third one is this. is a, a shared pursuit of sacrificial love for one another. We are brought into the love that exists between the Father and the Son. Our love for one another is shown by how we bear one another. Another's burdens. How we instruct one another. How we forgive one another. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Submit to one another. And provoke one another, not to anger, but to love and good works and all the other one another's that are in the Bible. Christ is not praying for us to to embrace a concept, but a conduct. He wants lives marked by unity. A unity that leads us to walk hand in hand together. With one another. Just as he, the Father, are one. It's why in Hebrews, the writer says to not give up meeting with one another. The church should be the safest place for a child of God. It must be. If this is the type of unity that we are to exemplify to this broken world, the safest place should be the church. Unity in the church is a powerful testimony to our broken world. And unity is a supernatural work and points to the supernatural reasons that Jesus is indeed alive in us. Unity displays God's glory and how magnificent he is. Jesus doesn't end there though. Not only does he he pray that that we would be united, he prays this magnificent prayer that we would be reunited with him. I don't know about you, but I needed this passage this week. And I hope it encourages your heart as much as it encourages mine. For Jesus says in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Our our unity glorifies God, giving us a foretaste of our reunion with Christ. Unity is so important because it reminds us again of what is on the other side. Jesus. The whole purpose of salvation is talked about in verse 24. Our unity is just a foretaste of our reunion with Christ. We just have a taste of what lies beyond this time. When we come to church, it reminds us of what is to come. And if unity isn't there, there's no reminder. So Jesus says, whom you have given me. This includes all the elect, both the original followers and those who would believe the message that they will proclaim. 
that they would see my glory. Christians from every generation glimpses, uh, see glimpses of Jesus' glory even now. But one day when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The glory of Christ that, has, that his followers will see is his glory as God. The glory he enjoyed before his mission because the Father's love for him. This word see here in the Greek means to observe with sustained attention. And also means the idea of entering into and experiencing something. We will experience the glory of God forever. For those who believe. And only those who believe. Because he says later, O righteous Father. He acknowledged, he is acknowledged to be profoundly righteous because of the judgment of the world for its rebellion against him. There's a, a creation of a contrast here for Jesus and his followers who are accepted. Because only those who believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again, shall be saved. To acknowledge that there is a holy God, that we have sinned against this holy God, and that our right punishment is hell, but because of Jesus' work on the cross, for anyone who confesses that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior, will have eternal life with Christ. No longer will there be things in the way. No longer will my sin be in the way. It will be me and Jesus. For all those who believe. So Jesus continues on, the world does not know you. This doesn't mean that Jesus' mission is a failure. Although the world does not know you, Jesus tells his father, he himself does. Jesus tells his father, he himself does and has made God known to his disciples. And he continues to do that. And as verse 26 comes, I will continue to make it known. God's gracious self-disclosure in his son will not be reduced to some sort of small blip in history. It will continue. And will be a lived experience. This happens for two reasons. First, that the love the father has for his son may be in us. You can think of it like amongst them. And displayed in our love for one another. Or another way might be within us. So that as we become loving people. It is impossible to think of one without the other. The big point of this is this. That this verse does not just make these followers the objects of God's love. Which is true as we see in verse 23. But promises that they will be so transformed as God is continually made known to them that God's own love for his son will become their love for one another. The love with which they learn to love is nothing less than the love amongst the persons of the Godhead. You cannot have an encounter with God and not be changed. It is impossible to say that you have experienced the love of God that is demonstrated here in this passage and not say you've been changed. It must be evident in your life. As the Holy Spirit sanctifies our lives, as we are created into a new creation, it comes out in us. There is fruit that comes from it. A speaker, a preacher named Paul Washer used this illustration to demonstrate this about how he was showing up. He starts the illustration by saying this. Imagine if I showed up 
to come and speak, and I was 30 minutes late. That would be bad, eh? And as I come in, the pastor comes and says, or let's say it's Barb, where have you been? Why are you late? And I say, oh, I got a flat tire because it took so long to get here from my house. I had to change the tire. And as I was changing the tire, one of the nuts flew off into the road. So I got up and grabbed the road. And as I grabbed the nut, I looked up and there was a 30-ton transport truck, logging truck coming my way. And it hit me. What would be the natural response? You're a liar. You cannot have an encounter with a 30-ton logging truck and not be changed permanently. You cannot have an encounter with God and not be changed. It is impossible. It comes out as we come together and, and we are united in the same love that God loved his son. We love one another. We bear with one another. We forgive one another. We give to each other sacrificially. We look out for the best in one another. There is fruit that comes out of this. But the second purpose of, of Christ's continuing work in making known his Father is that Jesus may be in us. And again, in them might mean amongst them or within them. Either way, this is the, nothing less than a fulfillment of the ancient hope that we have that Christ will be with us. I will continue to make it known. A pastor said it this way. We do not see Christ now. We read of him. We hear of him. We believe in him. And rest our sins in his finished work. But even the best of us, at our best, walk by faith and not by sight. And our poor, halting faith often makes us walk very feebly in the way to heaven. There shall be an end to, of all this state of things one day. We shall at length see Christ as he is. And know as we have been known. We shall behold him face to face. And not through some glass darkly we will actually be in his presence and company and go out no more if faith has been pleasant much more will sight be and if hope has been sweet much more certain to be as i was looking at this it reminds me so much of first thessalonians there's an amazing passage as we reflect upon. I was reflecting upon it this week. I don't know how many times I've looked at this passage, and, 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 I, and I think I may be I'm the only one, but sometimes we get so stuck up in, in series of events when we read through books. We've got to do our charts and our graphs, and we completely miss the point. Completely. Because in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says this in verse 13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And he continues on. And he says this in the verse 17b. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I don't know how many times I've read that and I completely missed it. And I go, okay, you know, theology, systematic, I need to look at my eschatology here and I need to make sure I understand all the true events. But Paul lays out these events for the purpose that I would encourage my brothers and sisters in these words that we will be with Christ forever. That I have a hope. 
So the unity that I'm experiencing that's glorifying God is just a foretaste of the reunion that I will have with Christ. I come together on a Sunday to remind myself of the hope that I have in Christ. If this week has been tough, this has been a tough season for your life. Look to the gospel. Be encouraged. Be amazed. Because you, true Christian, shall be with Christ. We need no more information than that. Where the person is who was born for us, died for us, and rose again, there can be no lack of anything. Our unity glorifies God. It is giving us a foretaste of our reunion With Christ. How could you not think about Revelation 7 verse 9? After this I looked. And behold a great multitude. That no one could number. From every nation. And all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Our unity is just a foretaste of our reunion with Christ. That's why we sing songs. Praise God together. That's why we preach the word. It won't be long until we get to go home. Not much longer and we'll forever enjoy peace and unity with the Father's house. In just a little while, we will experience the unhabituated love the Father and Son have shared from before the foundation of the world but we can begin to experience it here and now. The church can be a taste of heaven. When people with different preferences and hobbies and jobs and genders and backgrounds, skin colors, accents and tastes, love one another with a love surpassing all human love. They open a window to heaven. And people begin to feel a breeze from a far off country. And then their soul awaken a long dormant hope. They want to go to the place and be with those people who know, see, and feel something different, something beyond, something more. Because the unity that is in the body of Christ is supernatural and is only accomplished through supernatural means. The love of God assures us we have a home and a country on the other side of the sea. This knowledge binds us together and spells out in a love that feels strangely foreign but still so familiar. When people see this love displayed in a million different little ways, they will hope it is real. And when the hope is confirmed, because it will be, they will understand the story is true. They will know Jesus lives and Jesus loves. Our unity glorifies God giving us a foretaste, glorifies God, giving us a foretaste of our reunion with Him. It is so important. You know, we look at these lists that Paul makes about sins, and we often go to big ones like homosexuality and say, look, they're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. Hey, listen up. Those who cause disunity within the body of Christ will also not. Because it takes glory away from God. And it takes away our witness to a broken world. We are united in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And as we are united, it glorifies God and gives us a foretaste of our reunion with him. Let us continue to praise and to worship him today.